Good morning. Um, the committee will come to order. Chairman Miller regrets he's not able to be here today, but uh, I will be standing in for him during his absence. And welcome. As we begin the committee's work for the second session of the 113th Congress, I believe it's appropriate to examine one of the top priorities this committee since 2011, improving employment opportunities for veterans, jobs. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the unemployment rate for all veterans in December of 2013 was 5.5%. This is in sharp contrast to December of 2010, when the unemployment rate for all veterans was 8.3%. This equates to a difference of over 369,000 jobs and more veterans finding work. While I believe that program, like the new GI Bill and VRAP, have helped to position veterans to obtain the skills needed to get a job in today's tough economy, the most significant factor in the drop in the unemployment rate has been that American corporations, and most importantly, small businesses, have truly stepped up to the plate and have made it a priority to recruit, hire, and retain veterans. These companies and trade associations have made hiring veterans a priority, not out of charity, but because it's simply a good business decision. They've learned that the soft and hard skills, as well as the incredible work ethic that veterans bring to the table, are unmatched and make them excellent employees. Today's panel of witnesses represent companies and associations that are among the best of the best when it comes to hiring and promoting and the hiring of veterans. These companies have not only launched initiatives to train and hire veterans, but they work within their own industries and across the private sector to bring innovative approaches to increasing employment in a veteran population. I hope that listening to their testimony and having the opportunity to ask them questions will give members a better understanding of the commitment these companies have to veterans and countless others who share this commitment in each of our districts. I'm also very interested to hear the panel's opinions on federally funded training and hiring programs for veterans that Congress funds every year. As many of you know, that improving the performance of these programs has been and will continue to be a focus of this committee, and I'm looking forward to learning what progress, if any, the private sector finds to be the most successful, in short, what works and what doesn't work. While great strides have been made in reducing veterans' unemployment rate, I think that we all agree that much more is needed to, to create the best environment for job creation and growth as our men and women continue to transition from active duty service into civilian life. I remain concerned uh, that overtaxation, crushing business regulations, which increase costs and reduce competitiveness, as well as, uh, as well-documented concerns and uncertainty surrounding the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, threaten the hard work of our panelists and many others in making it a priority to hire our veterans. I look forward to hearing from each of you of our panelists today on how Congress can promote pro-growth policies that will help create new jobs for veterans and all Americans alike. At this time, I yield to the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Michel. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for having this uh, very important and timely hearing uh, this morning. Uh, providing veterans with an opportunity for employment is a top priority of this committee. In the tough economic uh, economy, we want to make sure we are doing everything that we can to help our veterans succeed in making that transition from active duty to serving uh, the communities and making meaningful uh, employment uh, gains in, in their respective areas. This is especially important as we look to uh, future service members leaving the military in greater numbers. Any employer should be proud to have an employee with the resiliency, leadership, and collaboration uh, and able to uh, do the fundamental uh, part of their job Far too often, these experiences are not readily translated to match the needs of the private sector. It takes imagination and a bit of work. But in the end, efforts is worth it. Businesses can get access to highly skilled and motivated individuals, and veterans can build careers that can benefit their families and their communities. This morning, I look forward to hearing about the successes and challenges our witnesses have faced and their recommendations when it comes to hiring veterans. I look forward to hearing how public and private entities can better work together to provide a better transition to the service members entering the workforce. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses regarding best practices and how we can 
and how they can be used uh, to inform the private and public sectors in helping veterans find jobs. But most of all, I look forward to hearing from our friends in the private sector about how our country's veterans are continuing to serve these, this nation by contributing their skills and talent uh, as they move forward in helping these companies be prosperous companies. Maintaining our nation's economic leadership in the decades ahead will require highly skilled and educated employees who will lead the technology change. Veterans have proven their leadership and can-do quality in service to our country. They represent an untapped resource to provide this next generation of employees. Our job on this committee and this Congress is to find ways to uh, explore new and innovative ways to assist veterans in the businesses that they wish to that hire them. This includes identifying what works and what doesn't work, what can be modified, and what must be uh, looked at differently. So I look forward to hearing all the witnesses today. And Mr. Chairman, once again, thank you very much uh, for having this very important hearing today. And I yield back to balance my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Michelle. At this time, I'd like to introduce our first and only panel today, and I want to thank each and every one of you for being here with us this morning. First, we have retired Brigadier General Gary Prophet, Senior Director of Military Programs at Walmart. Thank you for your service. And Mr. Sean Kelly, Naval Academy graduate, uh, Senior Staffing Director for the Cloud and Enterprise Group, as well as Military Recruiting at Microsoft Corporation. And Mrs. Maureen Casey, uh, the Managing Director for Military and Veterans Affairs at J.P. Morgan Chase. We next have Mr. Jim Amos, Captain Amos, uh, I think two tours in Vietnam, the chairman of the Taste of Light and Planet Smoothie. A little cool for that today, uh, but Captain, but I would take one if you offered it. Uh, here on behalf of the International Franchisee Association, and lastly, we have Mr. Ross Cohen, the Senior Director of Hiring Our Heroes at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Each and every one of you, thank you for being here. Your complete written states, statements will be made part of the hearing record, and each of you will be recognized for five minutes, and we won't cut you off right as the red light goes off, but try to begin wrapping up your uh, testimony at that time. Uh, let's begin with General Prophet, sir. You are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Rowe and uh, Ranking Member Michaud and, and members of the House uh, Committee on Veterans Affairs, on behalf of Walmart Stores Incorporated, I want to thank you for the opportunity to join you today to talk about veteran hiring. Walmart has a rich history with veterans, those continuing to serve, and military families. Arguably, it begins with Captain U.S. Army Sam Walton, who founded Walmart over 50 years ago. Through the years, the legacy has been enriched by countless others and the 100,000 veteran associates and 150,000 veteran and military family associates who are part of the current generation of Walmart. At Walmart, we are thankful for their service and sacrifice, and we strive to support their heroism. Right now, we know that one of their biggest needs is employment and gain the tools necessary to prepare for a career outside of the military. Besides being the right thing to do, veteran hiring uh, is also good for business, as you said, Mr. Chairman. We believe veterans and military families represent the largest, diverse, talent-rich pool in the world and are an essential segment of the next generation at Walmart. Their value begins with a rock-solid foundation, a proxy for which might be the seven army value as I lived for over 31 years. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. It is complemented by the nation's huge investment in skills training and leader growth and development. Frankly, who wouldn't want to hire them? But there must be a sense of urgency associated with all of that. 2.6 million post 9-11 veterans have left the service and in, in the next five years, one million more will leave. About half of them are between the ages of 18 and 34, and unemployment for these younger veterans 
has often been more troubling than for their non-veteran counterparts. So at Walmart, we decided to do our part and launched the Veterans Welcome Home Commitment last Memorial Day. Veterans who meet the job requirements and have been honorably separated from active duty within the last 12 months have a job at Walmart if they want one. Walmart has a host of opportunities at our stores and clubs across the country, as well as select opportunities in our distribution centers and main offices. If you served and sacrificed for your country, you shouldn't have to fight for a job when you get home. We believe that in the course of the next five years, we will hire more than 100,000 veterans. Since full implementation on Memorial Day, we have hired nearly 30,000 veteran associates. These jobs range from part-time hourly to salaried management, from Walmart stores and Sam's clubs to distribution centers and transportation offices and to the corporate headquarters. One aspect of this commitment of which we are most proud is the Veteran Champion Program. This program is a six-week onboarding process to support the transition and integration of the new veteran associates into their new work environments. It is guided by an associate drawn preferably from a similar experiential portfolio. In addition to employment, we also strive to understand and address some of the specific and special unmet and undermet needs faced by veterans and families. Through the Walmart Foundation, we are committed to a $20 million campaign through 2015 and are focused on access to education, job training, and reintegration resources. Additionally, as part of our holiday giving, we announced on Veterans Day a $1.5 million grant to Operation Homefront Home for the Holidays program and a $500,000 grant to the Fisher House Foundation Sponsor a Family program. <clears throat> Excuse me. The grants provided toys, meals, and lodging to military families in greatest need and support and helped hundreds of active duty service members come home for the holidays. We salute America's heroes. We are honored to have the opportunity to employ them, to learn from them, and to support them and their families in every way we can. Through career training and job opportunities, we're helping prepare our troops for successful professional lives, both during and after their service to the military. Thank you, and I appreciate your leadership and for holding this hearing. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and am prepared to answer any questions. Thank you, General Prophet. Uh, Mr. Kelly, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Michaud, and members of the committee. It is an honor to testify today to discuss how companies like Microsoft partner to maximize civilian career opportunities for our returning veterans. My name is Sean Kelly and I'm the Senior Dir Staffing Director for the Cloud and Enterprise Engineering Group at Microsoft and the leader of our company-wide military recruiting efforts. As a military veteran and third generation Navy family member, I share this committee's passion and commitment to support employment opportunities for military veterans. Microsoft has had a long-standing commitment to supporting veterans. Our military community has grown into a vibrant organization which now boasts seven chapters nationwide. This organization advises Microsoft leadership on broad-ranging topics from benefits for our Guard and Reserve employees to special events. This spirit of community has fueled the success of our military recruiting initiative, which we have branded We Still Serve. In the community, we have been early participants in public-private partnerships seeking solutions to the challenges of veteran unemployment. Through our Elevate America initiative, Microsoft partnered with six nonprofit organizations to provide skills training, job placement, and support services to veterans and their spouses. Microsoft's commitment to this effort totaled $12 million in cash, software, and other services. Also, Microsoft partnered with the U.S. Department of Labor to distribute 10,000 free technology skills training and certification packages to veterans around the country. These industry-recognized certifications provide portable job credentials. 
But what I'm most excited about today is Microsoft Software and Systems Academy. Any career transition is difficult, but as veterans approach the end of their military careers, it's not always clear to them how their skills will apply to jobs in the private sector. Thanks to the Vow to Hire Heroes Act of 2011, sponsored by Chairman Miller and Senator Murray, service members may begin the transition process before their separation from the military much sooner. The Microsoft Software and Systems Academy is designed to meet such demand. The goal of the Academy is to create a seamless and successful military to employment transition at no cost to the service member. It provides industry certification testing and college credit for those in service while they are still in the early phase of transition from their military to the civilian careers. For the curriculum, Microsoft partnered with local university to create a rigorous 16-week technical training course that military members are enrolled in while still on active duty. Soft skills, interview practice, and resume prep preparation are taught, and each student receives a mentor from a co corporate sponsor and exercises to practice their new skills. MSSA operates on base in conjunction with DOD education and transition program partners. With command authorization, service members attend the course at their place of duty during their transition phase. I'm happy to report that service members who completed the MSSA pilot program were offered high paying career opportunities, many six figures, at either Microsoft or Launch Consulting, a veteran owned business partner. Alternatively, some graduates use their new skills to find technology jobs on their own to pursue or to pursue a four year degree in computer science. As the program reaches additional bases around the country, we will guarantee job interviews to those who successfully complete it, a critical step between acquiring any certification and, and acquiring meaningful employment. We're confident that graduates of the program will be well prepared to compete for jobs in the vibrant, growing sector of the economy. Each time I look into the eyes of a transitioning service member, I am that much more motivated to find new ways to open doors to technology for my fellow veterans. Here are a few recommendations to enhance the private sector's ability to employ more of our veterans, which I explain in detail in my re written testimony. First, enhance the GI Bill language and funding for STEM and computer science related degrees. Provide access to contact information of veterans attending college on the new GI Bill through a confidential opt-in solution to encourage stronger employment opportunities and alignment to STEM degrees. Broaden the impact of programs like MSSA around the country by encouraging top-down support from all service branches for on-base programs. Encourage uniformity in tuition assistance across military branches to reduce the complexity and roadblocks for service members. In closing, let me emphasize that military veterans are a national treasure. Microsoft is fully committed, as am I, to continue to innovate, invest, and participate in the circle of solutions that bring our military veterans to family wage careers of the future. Now is the time to act to accelerate progress by aligning our resources behind proven concepts that lead to high paying jobs in the new economy. Thank you for your commitment to veterans. I look forward to answering your questions, and I thank you for allowing me to share my story and Microsoft's commitment to our nation's veterans. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Casey, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Michaud, and distinguished committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify about J.P. Morgan Chase's military and veteran employment initiatives. There is no group our firm holds in higher regard than service members and veterans. We can't thank them enough for their service. This hearing comes at a critical time. Given the rising tide of transitioning service members, J.P. Morgan Chase has dedicated significant resources to build a comprehensive program focused on veteran employment, education, and housing. Since 2011, J.P. Morgan Chase is extremely proud to have hired more than 6,300 veterans, and it's still counting. The private sector has learned a great deal about the benefits of hiring veterans, and we are delighted to share four lessons we've learned about how we do it. First, public and private sector collaboration is crucial. Second, it is critical to bridge the knowledge gap between civilian and military cultures. Third, we must help newly hired veteran employees develop a connection to our firm from the very start. And lastly, education and training are critical to employment success. I will summarize these points from my written testimony. 
First, collaboration is critical. JP Morgan Chase launched the 100,000 Jobs mission in March 2011 with 10 other companies. Our goal to hire 100,000 veterans by 2020 has already been surpassed. In less than three years, the coalition has hired 117,500 veterans. Given the momentum, we have doubled our goal to 200,000 hires by 2020. Today, the coalition is 131 companies strong, representing virtually every industry. Our goal is to significantly grow the coalition, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Employers can join by visiting our jobsmission.com, where leading practices can also be found. Second, bridging the knowledge gap. JP Morgan Chase's Veteran Employment Program focuses on the entire continuum, recruiting, mentoring, and retention. To bridge the knowledge gap, we established a military recruiting team, many of whom are former military and current Guard and Reserve members. This team helps to translate applicants' experience and offer interview advice. Public sector programs are also very important to our recruitment strategy. We work with national and state programs through the Departments of Defense and Labor and Veterans Affairs, the service branches, and the National Guard and Reserve. While not an exhaustive list, we have hired candidates through each of these partnerships. Notably, J.P. Morgan Chase recently hosted a constructive private sector coalition meeting with Defense Secretary Hagel to discuss ways to better align transitioning service member initiatives. Thirdly, developing an organizational connection from the start. Mentorship programs are vital to a successful transition. J.P. Morgan Chase programs include our employee networking group, Voices of Employees That Served, where veterans help veterans understand corporate culture. Pathfinder, inspired by military specialists who navigate unknown terrain to help veterans establish career goals. Body Armor to Business Suits, to help newly hired, new hires build an immediate connection to our company. Importantly, our employee programs include military spouses who also shoulder the service member sacrifice. And we know the knowledge gap is a two-way street. So we developed Military 101 to teach our civilian colleagues, including senior leadership, about military culture. Finally, supporting veteran education is another key element to our strategy. J.P. Morgan Chase co-founded Syracuse University's Institute for Veterans and Military Families. The program offers tuition-free training and certification in technology, human resources, and other studies. As we know, veterans can face unique challenges in educational settings. With this in mind, I am extremely proud to announce today that J.P. Morgan Chase is committing $1 million to expand veteran programs at educational institutions. Initially, grants are being awarded to Florida State College at Jacksonville, the University of Texas at Arlington, University of South Florida, and San Diego State University. Ultimately, our collective success will be measured by how well the private and public sectors can work together to help transitioning service members and veterans. J.P. Morgan Chase looks forward to continuing our work with Congress to position veterans and their families for long-term success. Thank you very much for your attention to this important and timely issue. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Casey. And uh, Captain Amos, uh, welcome home, and you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Mashad, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on successful private sector programs for hiring veterans. My name is Jim Amos. I'm chairman of Tasty Delight and Planets movie. Uh, I'm a veteran of the franchise industry with past experience as CEO of mailboxes, etc. Now the UPS store and uh, other franchise companies. Also a military veteran, uh, a former Marine Corps captain with uh, combat tours in Vietnam, and past chairman of the International Franchise Association. And it's on their behalf that. Uh, I'm sharing these comments with you this morning. With nearly one million veterans transitioning out of the military service over the next five years, it's more important than ever that we help veterans reintegrate into the civilian economy. It's both an economic necessity and a moral obligation for our, our, our country, in my view. Franchising uh, is a large and diverse business community that operates using the franchise business model are business format franchising. In franchising, entrepreneurs open their own businesses and they purchase the rights to use trademarks, products, and business strategies of a proven franchise business. 
Franchise owners are typically highly motivated individuals who are natural problem solvers, and successful franchise owners normally exhibit excellence in the execution of business plans. Above all else, veterans possess the leadership skills and the ability to execute plans that are necessary to run a successful business, and incidentally to persevere through uh, difficult economic times, as uh, we've recently experienced. For nearly 40 years, I've been privileged to both create and support programs for hiring veterans. And what I've learned is that these young men and women are clear examples of American exceptionalism. They're true American heroes who bring back security clearances and training and character and passion and dedication and a get-it-done mentality that, frankly, any company should uh, appreciate and want to have as a human asset. Uh, I've learned in my own career that spreadsheets and net present values can tell you the history of a company when you're doing due diligence on the business itself. But it's the people uh, that's going to tell you its future. Recognizing that franchising is a great fit for entrepreneurial veterans, the International Franchise Association launched the Veterans Franchising Initiative, or VetFran, in 1991. VetFran is an industry-wide initiative to encourage franchise companies to both hire veterans as team members and recruit them as franchise owners. As part of VetFran, VetFran 618 franchise, franchise ORs offer special incentives to qualified veterans who purchase franchises. And these incentives can range from thousands of dollars uh, in inventory to special financing for equipment, discounts on initial franchise fees, uh, and many other uh, broad uh, benefits. As an example, when I first became chairman and CEO of Mailboxes Etc., I followed the guidance put in place by VetFran, and as a result, uh, we focused on hiring programs and programs to create benefits and incentives for, for veterans, and as a result, hundreds of uh, veterans became part of the MBE UPS community. So before I go into the general results, uh, I'd like to offer uh, a couple of uh, things just to level set the problem. There are roughly 23 million veterans today in our country. 3.7 million are under the age of 39 and 1.5 and million roughly are on active duty, another 1.2 million in the Guard and Reserve. There are two million children in these households, with 95% being under the age of 12. And I can tell you, uh, as all of the folks sitting here on this panel, that repatriating these men and women, uh, the challenges that are associated with and the needs uh, within their family levels uh, are just absolutely enormous. A survey of VetFam members reveals that the program itself has achieved some significant results. In 2011, IFA launched Operation Enduring Opportunity, a campaign to hire and recruit as franchise business owners 80,000 veterans, wounded warriors, uh, and their spouses by 2014. In a report on Veterans Day in 2013, uh, we saw that the franchise industry had nearly doubled its hiring target. And since 2011, we've hired over 151,000 veterans and have started careers in franchising, including 5,192 veterans that have been recruited as franchise owners. <clears throat> to assist veterans in opening franchise small businesses, Con Congressman Bill Flores introduced the Veterans Entrepreneurs Act of 2013, a legislation that provides a tax credit to qualified veterans worth up to 25% of the initial franchise fee. When coupled with the incentives offered by franchise systems as part of VetFran, this tax credit will go a long way towards helping veterans open new businesses. The franchise community has already demonstrated a record of success in implementing veterans hiring programs, and this legislation will help veteran entrepreneurs realize their dreams of owning a small business. Franchise community has been successful in hiring uh, and recruiting veterans, but there's still a great deal of work to do to serve these veterans who have served us honorably. Far too many veterans are unemployed and others lack the support they need to successfully transition into the civilian economy. It's an imperative that the private sector continue to build on its 
recent success and work as best it can with policymakers here in Washington uh, to improve uh, hiring veterans. You know, and I just would might add, might add as an aside that uh, for my brothers and sisters that came home from Vietnam, we came home to a nation that was uh, really interested in leaving an unpopular war behind, and by proxy, uh, we left the veteran behind, and I don't think we should ever do that again. And uh, that's really what the focus of these programs, uh, in my view, should be. I want to just thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Amos. Uh, now recognize Mr. Cohen for five minutes. Good morning, uh, Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Michaud, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Ross Cohen. I serve as the Senior Director of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation's Hiring Our Heroes program and an Army veteran of Operation Enduring Freedom. Thank you for providing us this opportunity to share our experiences regarding successful approaches to hiring veterans and military spouses. Since 2011, Hiring Our Heroes, working with many of the partners who are uh, testifying with me today, have connected more than 21,600 veterans, transitioning service members, and military spouses to meaningful jobs through more than 660 job fairs hosted in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. Through employment workshops at these fairs, we have provided expert job search and readiness training to 8,000 more men and women. In March 2012, we launched the Hiring 500,000 Heroes campaign with a goal of getting businesses of all sizes to commit to hire half a million veterans and military spouses by the end of 2014. I'm pleased to report that more than 1,400 businesses of all sizes have committed to hire 361,000 veterans and spouses, and to date, 247,000 hires have been confirmed. We are also developing a suite of online services to assist in the transition to the civilian sector. From our resume engine and e-mentor programs to fast track and our military spouse LinkedIn networks, these tools make it easier for veterans to identify and achieve career opportunities. From the beginning, we knew that our success hinged on two critical factors. First, the effort had to be driven at the community level. And through the Chamber's vast federation of state and local chambers of commerce, we were able to reach employers of all sizes throughout the nation. Second, we had to work closely to bring these communities together by working with a wide array of public, private, uh, and non nonprofit entities, including partners across multiple federal agencies and local governments and other nonprofit veteran and military family service organizations. Indeed, we have forged key partnerships with the White House's Joining Forces Initiative, the U.S. Departments of Veterans Affairs and Labor Vets, and several Department of Defense entities, including the Military Spouse Employment Program, the Army's Installation Command, and many others. Most recently, more recently, we collaborated with the VA to create a national guide to hiring veterans that points employers to the most valuable resources available to assist them in the process of hiring and retaining veterans and military spouses. The value of these partnerships becomes evident at our hiring fairs, where the entire community comes together. State and local chambers work hard to bring jobs from local businesses. Military officials, including from the Guard and Reserve components, frequently open up their facilities to host these events. The VA plays a critical role by making sure that veterans are utilizing their benefits. DOL and the American Job Centers provide ongoing assistance, and the employer support of the Garden Reserve, the American Legion, and so many others provide invaluable resources in every state. And together, we are making a difference. When we began our work in March 2011, the employment situation was bleak. Post-9-11 veterans faced an unemployment rate greater than 12%. For veterans under 25, it was closer to 30%. One in four military spouses was unemployed. There is no doubt that for some, the situation has started to improve. We have seen post-9-11 veteran unemployment fall below 10%, and unemployment for veterans under 25 is down 10 points to approximately 20%. According to a 2012 Department of Defense report, however, one in four military spouses remain unemployed. Indeed, we have a long way to go. The fact is 800,000 veterans were unemployed at the beginning of 2013, and we are about to see an unprecedented number of departures from the military, not including spouses. So the private sector needs to step up even more. Hiring Our Heroes is ready to answer this call. Not only will we host more than 200 hiring fairs across the country this year, we will focus our efforts by targeting communities with the greatest need and by continuing to develop our suite of online services so that veterans and employers anywhere in the world can utilize them. We will also strengthen our private-public partnerships. One upcoming example is occurring next week 
where we will take part in a two-day Veterans Job Summit at Fort Bliss, Texas. Hosted by the Army and in partnership with the VA and Department of Labor, the summit will feature seminars on the transition process, tools and best practices for employers looking to hire, and presentations from key private sector, military, and governmental agencies. The summit will culminate with a job fair for transitioning soldiers, veterans, and their spouses. Over the last three years, Hiring Our Heroes has been proud to serve as a community catalyst, bringing together our partners in our common mission. We will continue working together to achieve change in veteran and military spouse unemployment. Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Michaud, and members of the committee, I thank you again for the opportunity to testify and look forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Coyne, and, and all the panelists for um, your testimony. I'll now yield myself uh, five minutes, and I want to start just by reading a paragraph of um, Mr. Amos' uh, testimony. When my brothers and sisters returned uh, from Vietnam, we were met by a nation so anxious to leave an unpopular war behind that by proxy we left the veterans behind as well. We should ensure that this will never that this never happens again. Amen to that statement. And I think it isn't. I think this is a testimony to the fact that it is not. And I thank you all. I, I think this is one of the for me. Uh, many times I will come to these hearings and, and leave in a depressed mood. This actually has elevated my mood. And in Washington, that's doing something if you can elevate somebody's mood. Um, I, I, I thank you for what each of your companies and the, uh, the, the coordination you're doing with other companies that are not here. They're, they're equally responsible for that. Um, I, I guess a couple things that I want to ask about, um, and, and it's going to start sort of from the back door because as I left to be deployed, I left a wife and a 12-week-old child at home. And you know, if, you didn't, if I hadn't had some family support, so the spouses are an integral part. And much of the problem I think we have with PTSD and other issues are family issues and money issues. And a spouse having a job or a veteran having a job, those problems go away. Many of those issues just go away. So I think that what you all are doing has, speaks volumes. I think one of the things that I, through all the testimony I read, that we, are the spouses not wanting to work or they cannot find work or they don't have the skills? Could somebody, uh, uh, maybe Mr. Cohen, you mentioned it twice, that that's the one thing that had not moved. The needle had moved on the spouses. And I think that's where when you're deployed, a lot of family issues begin to uh, uh, erupt and so forth. Could you, so anybody can take that question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that it, it is a core issue that the private sector um, has, has really taken up in the past year, two years, this issue of military spouse employment. Um, I wouldn't put myself as an expert on the issue, but I think some of the core issues are frequent moves um, and having to, as you said, sir, take care of a family while your loved one is deployed uh, makes it more challenging. But I do think this is being uh, this is being, it's, it's noted and I think being addressed aggressively now. Okay, could, could any of you all take this question? What programs have we, have we as a Congress passed that you all find very effective and which are the ones that are not effective? That we maybe should, should uh, as we go through this next year's uh, appropriations process, move the resources around to things that actually work. So I, I'll just open it up to anybody that wants to, to jump on that. On, 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 on Ross's comment, um, first of all, I. I uh, would be remiss uh, in not telling you that uh, if I didn't talk about military spouse and family issues, I probably couldn't go home to my wife of 42 years who <laughs> followed me around the world for many years and, and struggled to maintain a career despite um, the same kind of values foundation and skills clearly that, that I had. Um, and one of the things that we've done at Walmart is to institute something that we try to take jobs for military families to careers and it's called the military family promise and basically it says that if your spouse is 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 moved as a result of of a military permanent change of station we'll find you a new job at that location um, and i think what the attempt has been um, with the breadth of our corporate footprint to turn those military spouse jobs into actual careers. And, and one of the things that, a, a face on that is a young woman who has been with us for I think 18 or 20 years now and has served in different Walmart roles 
from Hawaii to uh, to New York. And so I think that, that, that that's testament to, to a commitment to those spouses and families that also serve our nation. Thank you. Anyone on the programs that we currently are, are that we have out there and what you think is working and not working? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I would take that question. Um, one of the programs that we at J.P. Morgan Chase are working with is the Department of Labor Vets and their American Job Centers. I think one of the things that, as you've heard my colleagues speak to, is really understanding what the challenges and needs are, whether we're talking about transitioning service members, veterans, or spouses, and then trying to connect them to the opportunities that exist. So what we've done is, through our work with the Department of Labor Vets, looked at key opportunities that J.P. Morgan Chase may have, whether we're talking about in Texas or California or Florida, Arizona, providing them with those key jobs. They will then utilize the resources that they have in those centers that are dedicated to veterans to, to scan the, the pool of talent that is there and then make referrals to us so that we can then um, connect them to opportunities in our company. Okay, I want just one brief thing and no answer because my, my time's expired is that um, one of the things is how do we make sure that the, that the transitioning veterans that are going to separate know about this because I can tell you that when uh, Captain Amos and I left the military, they said, son, be sure the gate didn't hit you. You know where on the way out the front door. Nobody said, what are, where are you going? What are you doing? Do you have a job? Does, is there anybody home? Nothing. So we've got to be sure that we have a way to make sure that, that the separating service member knows where to go get this incredible amount of resources that are sitting in front of our committee. My, my time's expired. I now yield to, to uh, Ranking Member Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this question is for Mr. Uh, Kelly. And I want to thank all the panelists once again for your testimony today. Uh, how many locations does uh, Microsoft anticipate establishing in MSSA program? Well, Congressman, our, our current intention is that uh, by the end of this calendar year, we would be in five locations around the United States. We're um, currently looking at how do we take this program to be a, a program that through the community college system and online could also be accelerated to, you know, far reaches of the U.S. that perhaps aren't co-located with a base location. Um, because we're in the early phase right now, what we were concentrating on in the the pilot was to prove the concept that we could train members before they exit the service and employ them all, which we accomplished in the first cohort. Um, and now we're looking at how fast can we replicate the model and uh, take it nationwide. Uh, thank you. Uh, this, uh, in your testimony today, uh, each of you described outstanding and highly successful uh, programs that support uh, veterans' employment. Uh, most of these programs uh, you discussed are uh, new programs. Uh, while veterans' issues are at the forefront uh, today uh, in, the na in the people's mind here, in Congress's mind, uh, these programs uh, you know, will endure while they're at the center. But what happens when veterans uh, fade away and are no longer on the front page uh, of the papers? Uh, you know, the federal government uh, you know, hasn't, as you heard earlier, hasn't treated our veterans kindly, particularly the Vietnam era veterans. And once it's no longer on the front page, my big concern is what will happen beyond the current war in Iraq and Af Afghanistan. And what does uh, the industry feel uh, that we should do in Congress, or what should the industry do in Congress to make sure, industry do to make sure that Congress does not let uh, our veterans fall behind and become a back page story instead of a front page story. And I'll, I'd ask each of the panelists if they could briefly make a comment. Um, well, first of all, I, I share your concern and, and the sense of urgency that we should all feel um, about uh, achieving uh, something that, that certainly we didn't do when those return from Vietnam. If I could offer one, I believe um, that we would be well informed by a national strategy that better leverages the very real complementary value that the private and nonprofit sectors bring to the public-private partnership and the responsibility to support those who have served and sacrificed for all of us 
And despite the real advances in robusting that partnership, I don't believe we've achieved an optimal level of integration and synchronization that would actually support our interest in renewal in uh, the economy and the interests of those who have served and sacrificed so much for this nation. Congressman, uh, there are two, two suggestions that I have, and both of them come from my lens as a talent acquisition leader uh, in the technology industry. And I would say first, um, continue to focus on investment in education. So um, any GI Bill enhancements, support for STEM education, uh, that would encourage uh, long-term uh, pipelining of talent into what really is all, all industries are becoming technology industries now, and I think that that has a long-term payoff, that education investment. The second is, uh, upon transition, I, I believe that the, the military veterans are the most codified human resource asset we have on the planet. And today, we still allow that resource to walk out the door, and we lose this amazing um, asset of information that could drive the economy, the specialties that people have learned, the education, their experiences. And if we could find a way to harness that and channel our veterans over the long term toward high paying jobs, um, ways to contribute to the nation's success and, and economic prosperity, we think those would be two areas that would uh, have big payoff. Congressman, thank you. I think hearings such as this are a great opportunity to continue the dialogue and, and highlight this issue. I think the other thing that we need to remember is that service members and their families don't come home to a federal agency. They come home to our communities. In J.P. Morgan Chase, we're in 25 states. We have 5,400 branches nationwide, and we know that these service members and their families are coming home to our communities. So what can we do to continue to raise awareness? Mr. Chairman, you spoke about that awareness issue. How do we ensure that they are informed consumers and also that our communities are prepared to provide the support and services that they need when they return? So we're trying to do that throughout all of our markets to really take it down to the branch level and work within our communities to make folks aware that Things like jobsmission.com exists where 131 companies have committed to hiring veterans and that there are resources available to spouses. But I think that all of the work that you do in forums like this is very helpful to keep, keep it on the front pages. Thank you. <clears throat> Congressman, I'd like to um, thank you for the question because I think it's the seminal question. And I think the needs are both organizational and uh, they're about communication. Nearly 40 years ago when I walked out the back gate at Quantico, Virginia, I felt like Captain America on one side of the gate and on the other side I didn't know who I was or where I was going. Um, I don't think we had the technological capacity to track a veteran to specifically to your question at that point, but I'll tell you this. I had a conversation with General Sinseki uh, just uh, a few months ago, and we don't have that capacity today. We still can't find these young men and women when they leave to help them uh, meet some of the challenges that they have. And so I, I would say this, having spent the last 35 years in meetings and listening to veterans, their spouses and children and programs, there's hundreds, hundreds uh, of organizations trying to meet the individual needs of returning veterans around this country, including what our government is doing. They're all disparate, they're all funded separately, some are nonprofit, some are profit. Uh, there's egos involved, there's organizational egos involved, so there's a lot of challenges to really, truly meeting the need of the veteran. Because this cause sounds great to everybody and everybody wants to participate until, as Chairman Rowe pointed out, the guns go silent. And then often the support goes silent. And so what I would suggest, like Mr. Reagan did in 1982 with small business, hold a summit, pull all these disparate pieces together, and talk about coordinating this effort so that there's a clearinghouse that when a veteran walks out the gate, he, can, he or she can press a button and find all the needs there for, in terms of someone to talk to. The needs we're talking about for these families, when, when we deployed, we deployed for 13 months at a stretch. During World War II, it was for the duration. Now, these young people are going back five and six tours at a time. You talk about jobs for the spouses and homes that they go to. I moved eight times in nine years in the Marine Corps. Now they're doing that 
uh, I mean, there's just, it's so difficult to hold these families together. They need jobs, number one. They need career counseling. They need marital counseling. They need a lot of help. And I think we need to try to coordinate the organization and the communication for these people in one place, if at all possible, so they can get that immediate need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, I, I'll conclude uh, by saying the uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. And the reason I, I am cautiously optimistic that uh, when, when the guns go silent, we will still have the energy to address this issue, because uh, the folks who are, who are on this panel here representing uh, some of the largest, most influential uh, companies and associations in the country, and the experiences of the past two years, I think, to, to some of the points made, can't be lost. So our challenge is, our, our opportunity is, for all the reasons people have said, this is not a hard sell. People want to hire veterans. They know that veterans and military spouses make outstanding employees. Uh, and we've learned a lot of lessons over the past several years, over the past decades. Uh, the challenge we have now is making sure that those lessons get deeply, deeply embedded into local communities across the country uh, over the next months and years to come. Okay, thank you, Mr. Michelle. Mr. Denham, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first start by uh, thanking Walmart. Uh, two years ago, uh, Mr. Walls and I, along with Senators Manchin and Kirk, started the Veterans Jobs Caucus, and Walmart uh, was uh, one of the first companies to step up and really show a huge impact in, in hiring veterans. And while we have 250,000 servicemen and women uh, returning home every year for the next five years, 100,000 is a huge, huge goal. And, and we thank you for your commitment in doing that. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me ask you, uh, you know, as you're looking at hiring veterans, uh, what is the gener generational breakdown that you're looking at? Um, are they mostly? post 9-11 veterans, or are you seeing older veterans that are looking to come to Walmart for the first time and, and start a new career? Very much for uh, um, recognizing the important work that we think we do with the caucus. Um, as, as, as was said before, we're in this for the long haul. We've been in this since the company was founded, and, and I think it's important work. Our focus, um, because we think they're the most vulnerable, is on those from 18 to 34. With that said, uh, we know that joining our ranks over the course of, of time, and certainly since the inception of the Veterans Welcome Home Commitment on, on Memorial Day, that we've had people from every generation join us. And, and so we're not dismissive of any of them. Walmart's a really big place, and we essentially have um, uh, an appetite for talent uh, across our enterprise, and so uh, we welcome all that that think that they can play a role in the next generation. Thank you. And um, let me briefly discuss how how I think, at least the vision that I would see as uh, helping our veterans to to find work. Um, you know, when I left uh, active duty. Uh, I was amazed to find out that as a crew chief, as somebody who could work on some of the most sophisticated aircraft in the world, it was going to take me three years of training to be able to work at any airfield uh, across the nation on, on less sophisticated aircraft, because we just didn't credential our military. Somehow that was going to create a competitive disadvantage for our recruiting offices. We passed that bill, and uh, I'm proud to see that that is uh, implemented into law. Uh, we are credentialing them. We are allowing them to, to utilize the skills that they gained on active duty. But I, I would say the next part of that vision would be once you get them credentialed, to actually give you guys the ability to go out and market to those specific career fields and understanding which career fields you're looking for and contact those men and women six months before they transition. So I think part of our challenge is we're always trying to find uh, out where somebody has been uh, um, discharged, what state they've been discharged from, and where they go afterwards, and do they come back to our home state, rather than being able to market to them before they leave active duty and finding that talent and really, uh, really, I think, encouraging those men and women that they're going to have a job, they're going to have a home, they're going to be able to have a family as soon as they, they leave active duty. And so I think that that is um, the next step. But I did have a question for Microsoft. Um, what you're doing is a little different from what we've been trying to do internally. So rather than uh, credentialing on the inside, you're looking at, at private credentials. 
uh, and integrating backwards into that, that training process. Could you explain a little bit more on, on the differences between the two? And uh, Congressman, thank you. The, the, the program itself, this was actually a very targeted um, effort around software testing jobs that, uh, you know, unfortunately we, we didn't have service members that were ready for that specific disciplinary and my focus as a recruiting leader was to find, to bring all the intangibles that come with military service at a thin slice of, uh, you know, essentially a crash course and, and the beauty of this program is in 16 weeks, whether you have a degree or not, regardless of the discipline that you had in the military, if your aspiration is to be working in the technology industry, this opens that door. And one of our significant challenges, many service members look at the banner called Microsoft or pick any other technology company and they don't see themselves as part of this industry. And we thought this would be a huge paradigm breaker in that regard. And you know, with our leadership to be able to see that we took a mechanic um, to take uh, somebody who's an aircraft commander or somebody who was maybe an IT operations person in the military and really just concentrate the learning and turn that into a job uh, is, has been a breakthrough, both just for people's belief that there are military members who can be participants in the STEM discipline areas at Microsoft or any other technology company. But we also have, uh, you know, people get their Microsoft developer certifications while on active duty and, and we've participated in the White House IT certification effort. So that's still another pipeline. We just felt like there was an opportunity, particularly pre-departure, to, to put this polishing on people's um, technology coding skills, which is a hard science area that we need for a lot of the jobs that we have. And if I could conclude with just a brief follow-up, is, is it a shotgun approach of anybody who's interested in Microsoft, or are you looking at ASVAB tests and um, specific career fields to say, that is somebody that we know would succeed here? Well, what we, we, we definitely mapped out the, the bases around the nation, looked at more technical areas, uh, specifically and, you know, identified over 30,000 military members that we believe are, you know, easily able to go into this program and transition into in the technology industry. So we did have targeting, but we also looked at frontline units that had very elite selection criteria, airborne, other units to, because we knew that there was rapid learning capability there um, for us to be able to, to target the accelerated learning path that we were um, you know, putting in front of, of the participants. But we look at ASVAB scores, math testing, and then a selection process to get into the program. So an Air Force crew chief might have actually had a shot. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, I yield back. <laughs> Ms. Brown, you're recognized. Thank you. First of all, let me just thank each and everyone for your service and your commitment to our veterans. Uh, for decades, the federal government has been the key a uh, gateway for veterans and good jobs and security. But that is not the case anymore. Uh, I am pleased that Mrs. Casey and J.P. Morgan Chase has announced that my hometown college, the Florida State College of Jacksonville, will be one of the recipients of the grant to fund higher education programs for the U.S. military. And I need to do a disclaimer. Before I came to Congress, I worked at the college for 16 years. And I know of the community, Jacksonville, and of course of the college commitment to veterans. So I want to thank you. And I want you to expound a little about that program in a minute. Uh, because one of the problems that let's say spouses are experiencing, because they have to move, maybe they're a teacher or a nurse and they're certified in Florida, but if they have to go to another state, they have to go through the process again. So we need to work to make sure that that certification will transfer. And of course, I want to ask um, Walmart about and, and, and thank you for all of you for your employment, but Walmart do a lot of businesses and you have a lot of private small business, and what kind of program did you have to help those veterans do business with you because you buy everything? And uh, so I'm interested in that, but I cannot let uh, this opportunity go by not to commend one of the companies in my district, CSX. They have twice been honored by the employer's support for their from the guards and reserves for their hiring and commitment to veterans. And in fact, the railroad industry have a great record of hiring veterans. 25% of the industry is veterans. 
and the Obama administration, along with the uh, John Forces Initiative and the VA and the Department of Ver Veterans have started a program, Veterans Transportation Careers. So we're going to, and you know, they have a lot of the logistical skills, and we're going to work to translate that into, you know, the workforce. So can you answer those questions? First of all, more about that program initiative, that education initiative. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Yes, we're quite excited about this program as well. I think that we just need to look at, in developing these education grants, um, we really looked at what the needs of transitioning service members and veterans are. So it really goes back to bridging the gap. How do we make sure that they're prepared to be students again? Number two, how do we ensure that they have the support services that when they're there to succeed. And number three, how do we educate the administration and the faculty about the needs of um, returning uh, student veterans? And so the particular program at Jacksonville is really focused on professional development for the faculty and administration so that they can understand the military culture, understand what some of the needs might be, and then also building out their support services for veterans to position them for success. So whether that's additional tutoring services, um, other kinds of counseling and support services, anything that will position these veterans for long-term success. Thank you. Uh, Walmart. Businesses. Thank you, Congresswoman, for the question. Um, first of all, um, one of the uh, elements of, of the veterans' welcome home commitment was the notion that Walmart can do a lot, but Walmart can't do as much as if we all work together. And we recognize the importance of our supplier network and those um, with whom we do business and, and I think have importantly begun work in our supplier diversity function to take a look at veteran-owned businesses particularly um, and how we can include them as an important segment um, in, in, in that particular supplier base. And so I think there's very, very important work being done uh, both to track them and encourage them to become our suppliers. Thank you. Um, I think that's about all the time I have. Uh, I, I, once again, I want to thank, thank all of you all for, for your service. But as I mentioned before, uh, I, I want to just share with you all. I went to a, a restaurant. Uh, let's just say it was a Waffle House. And the, someone knew that I was in there, and they told the lady that was serving me. The lady was a veteran. She told me she was homeless. And I, it, it, it just broke my heart. And she had no place to stay. So they need more than just finding a place to stay. The system was broken. And it's still, this lady still have not gotten the kind of help that she needs, even though I referred her. And she needs more than a house. She needs the counseling component. She needs the educational component. So it really does take the whole team. So I want to thank you again. Thank you for yielding, uh, Ms. Woloski. You've recognized. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And I just wanted to also thank and commend every one of you for sitting here and for what you're doing to lead the nation in this comeback of jobs for veterans. We have, I'm from Indiana, we have a proportionally higher number of veterans in Indiana with the fourth largest guard in the country. And uh, Hoosiers definitely take up the, the call when called. Um, but one question I have is um, when we hear about best practices and we hear a lot about, I call them P3s, we've used them a lot in Indiana public-private partnerships, they've worked and I've uh, traditionally been a huge supporter of them. And I'm looking at, in, in our district, in northern Indiana, we're heavy manufacturing, one of the largest manufacturing districts in the country, and 80% of those are small companies. So from your perspective, you, you folks are all representing large, huge companies. And I guess, you know, what can we take and translate down to smaller companies that would incentivize them to be involved? Because in my district, many times when you say, I'm, I'm here, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, they're like, no, thank you, shut the door, leave me alone, and get off my back, and we'll do fine. But when we talk about things like, Mr. Amos, you talked about the tax credit from Representative Flores and things like that. So is this really something that 
can be federally driven things that will help incentivize smaller companies or how do you see it since you're the experts here in the in the field anybody well first of all I'd like to point out that uh, when you talk about franchising although there's significantly large companies billions and billions of dollars they're all built on the premise of independent franchise owners so all of it is small businesses and all of the hiring that's been accomplished here through these uh, VetFran programs uh, have been done at the small business level. Uh, there is some employment that takes place at the corporate level in these businesses, but uh, clearly the, the logwood here comes from small business. So uh, any programs that can uh, <laughs> provide the relief for a small business owner, I mean, uh, the, the, the uh, Affordable Care Act was mentioned uh, without discussing, obviously, the uh, employer and employee mandate. But essentially, if you, if you want to respond broadly, any tax relief at that level, any relief uh, of the burden on the regulatory level for small business, the ability to hire, the incentive to hire. If I'm a small businessman and it, uh, or woman, and it uh, appears to me that uh, uh, I have a Hobson's choice as an example mm -hmm. between paying a, uh, a penalty um, or providing health care at that level. Uh, I'm obviously going to matriculate to that place where I have more free capital to invest in my business that uh, uh, involves hiring as well as many other things, including opening new locations which create new employment and new tax dollars and new revenue. Uh, it's, uh, to me, uh, as a relatively simple individual in terms of how small business operates, uh, that's not rocket science. It's just uh, opening the way, uh, which is why I talked about the summit of, on small business a while ago in conjunction to what we're talking about here, because I think that's the way you offer relief and create incentives mm -hmm. for hiring to take place. Anybody else? Uh, offer. Um, when Bill Simon talked at the National Retail Federation a year ago uh, about American renewal, um, and he uh, followed that up just the other day by talking to the U.S. Council of Mayors, and a very important element of that was uh, our focus on U.S. manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that the time is right um, to, to uh, put a special emphasis on U.S. manufacturing, and we think we're investing in it, um, and importantly, have some very important goals that we want to meet. And so, I, I think that uh, to place a, a, a special focus and a special emphasis on that is very well timed, and we would certainly be willing to join that public-private partnership. And frankly, think we already have. That's great. And I would just yeah. offer, Congresswoman, that the other half of that equation. It goes back to a reoccurring theme that we've heard here today is around ensuring that veterans are informed consumers. We know that more than 50% of veterans are going to go to work in small business. Mm -hmm. So how do we do a better job at creating this matching the supply to the demand, creating that connection of those that are transitioning out with knowledge and information about where the job opportunities are. So I think there's definitely room for improvement in that regard. I appreciate it. In general, let me just uh, say to one of your colleague institutions, Sam's Club does a phenomenal job in my district in a place called Goshen, Indiana. They do veteran days. And I was uh, uh, grateful to participate in one a couple of years ago where it was, uh, you know, um, refreshments and discounts and all kinds of things to attract in veteran families, highlighting things that families would need and be in need of that were, you know, specifically reduced for folks that had a, a veteran card type thing and, and celebrating that they were a veteran with red, white, and blue decorations in the store and cake and all kinds of things for their kids. It was awesome. And, uh, and it's just one of the ways, I think, uh, to your point, Mr. Amos, and um, continually educating and advocating for veterans coming home that they've done the job we've asked them to do. So to all of you, I just I so much appreciate your, your comments and how we can translate them back into our districts. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, General for yielding. Mr. Kelly, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll start off with Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly, uh, uh, as a former community college trustee for 23 years and also as a teacher uh, as a, in the high schools, um, you know, I, this is where I come from. Uh, do, you, do you think our service members are receiving enough counseling and information 
about their futures and transitions out of the service? And are they receiving uh, this counseling and information early enough? Congressman, thanks for the, the uh, opportunity to comment. The, um, de definitely not. I think this is one of those um, long-standing issues in, that has gotten a lot better with the VOW Act. Um, but I think we have this um, opportunity to, to make it part of the leadership responsibility of the military to understand that everyone's going to transition. And, you know, we've, um, we've had such pressure on those unit leaders to be mission ready. Um, and we need to transition that thinking to say that it's part of our opportunity to counsel our young members of the military or those that are nearing retirement that the planning needs to start 18 months out in order to align for, yeah. for their transition. Thank you. Uh, so we need to begin not just not just with a crash course at the end, but at the beginning and throughout. Can you talk about the partnership you have started with community colleges and how you would like to expand this partnership? And what makes community colleges logical partners? In our experience, we, we worked with community colleges uh, in our Elevate America program with Project Succeed at Bellevue Community College right near Microsoft. Um, we're looking at partners in the community college system because we uh, particularly with our 16-week academy program, th there's more um, flexibility uh, with the leaders in the community college system at this time to look at a unique program and, and responsiveness at the pace we're trying to roll this out. And the um, locales near our bases, many of them are already on our military installations, which is an accelerator as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for, uh, for that. Mr. Amos, I want you to know that I'm, uh, as the ranking member on the subcommittee on uh, on uh, economic opportunity, I've also the lead co-sponsor of Mr. Flores' bill to provide the tax incentive uh, for uh, franchising. I'm a great admirer of franchising. I think it's a great uh, entrepreneurship with training wheels. It uh, gives people some guidance. Um, along the lines I asked Mr. Kelly, the question that I asked Mr. Kelly, uh, that I posed Mr. Kelly, uh, about uh, preparation throughout the service member's career, um, could we do more? Uh, in terms of getting entrepreneurship uh, in the minds of these uh, service members? Uh, uh, for instance, um, is there a way for us to, to also, I know we can use our tax sheltered deductions. Uh, first of all, get the service members to be thinking about that sort of saving, but uh, is there currently a way for a service member to parlay those savings, uh, part of them, uh, with their contributions into maybe a down payment on a franchise? Well, there are with incentives that were created through programs like VetFriend. Uh, I, I, I think that that path uh, is almost uh, unintelligible to the person who's leaving the military today, however. And so the education that you're talking about that should begin ahead of time, uh, in all likelihood, doesn't. And I would like to point out that sometimes the military has um, the ability, uh, no pun intended here, to shoot themselves in the foot in these issues as well. And I would say uh, the reason why is because the mission, the, the, the mission orientation is so intense and so focused that if you are a regular officer, as I was, or someone that is in the military uh, as a career or an intent to be uh, have a career, uh, all of the uh, infrastructure within inside the military is designed to focus on people who and get people to stay in and make it a career. And so there's very little discussion of people that are leaving, and they're not set up to have that discussion. And when the decision is made to leave, um, internally, if people were going to be perfectly honest about themselves, it's almost as if their back is turned on someone who has decided they're not going to have the same goal. Uh, and I'm just suggesting that internally inside the military itself there is a um, almost an implicit um, lack of attention paid to people uh, when they choose to leave. So there's not a discussion about uh, a certain amount of deduction each month uh, and the compounded uh, gain. Uh, could someday be used as a down payment on a franchise. It's, you, it's, you don't have a choice. You know, there's choices other than transitioning into uh, a salary job that you could own a business someday. Um, we, we don't get them to think about this early on in their in their career. Not 
today, not yeah. in the present environment. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, for yielding, Dr. Winster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here and, and trying to make such a, an impact on our veterans' lives. I appreciate that. There's been a lot of discussion. Um, uh, I'm a reservist, spent a year in Iraq, and I, I still drill. I was at uh, Fort Lewis last year doing preventive medicine. Um, I think a lot of things what we're talking about here is preventive medicine if we capture them early. I mean, you talk about all the pitfalls and problems of leaving the military and the stresses that are upon you, especially if you don't have a job. And uh, one of the things I was encouraged about when I was at Fort Lewis last year is the effort to try and give some guidance and counseling to service members that are getting out of the military. And, you know, this is Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, that really falls under Armed Services Committee, where I think we need to make some changes. And I want your opinions on that, because as, as great as it is to do all these things and we need to continue to do for, for veterans, you know, of, of all eras uh, that have been out there and are struggling, I think that we have greater successes if we capture them while they're still in uniform. Now, Captain Amos, you referred to the culture of the military as more towards stay in, stay in, stay in. So where do we, where do we start to engage heavily with those that said, I'm getting out, um, when there's that sort of um, I, I, ideal of keeping them in the military? Um, I mean, I would call it second career counseling or what have you. When I talk to veterans that are going to use their GI Bill, I, I encourage them to study and make sure you get a skill that will get you a job when you're finished. Um, I know Mr. Kelly, Microsoft has been engaging with those that are still in uniform, if you care to comment on that. And um, Captain Amos, your, your opinion too uh, on the dichotomy there. Go ahead. Congressman, I'll crystallize uh, the, the example of the graduates out of our program at uh, Joint Base Lewis-McChord uh, with the support of Colonel Hodges there, the, the base commander. Um, you know, of the graduating class, a number of them uh, who felt supported, guided um, by their leadership actually have now become citizen soldiers and have signed up with the National Guard in Washington. I think this uh, underscores the long-term thinking that if we had that support in the leadership, and I do think this is an expectation that leaders would accept. It's not their mission focus now, but if, if we uh, establish a leadership ethos in the military that has the long view, that says my, and I feel like leaders feel that accountability to their soldiers and, and to say your long view is to help them have a life plan. We look at their whole life. We look at how their family's doing, their savings, their education, and we do it with concentrated focus while they're on active duty. And we just have to extend that horizon and also show the benefit, which is someone who leaves happily will end up potentially being a, a, res a drilling reservist that is also a, a critical part of our system. It seems to me this is a conversation we need to have within the Armed Services Committee as well. Come, Amos. Well, no, I, I, I agree with that entirely, and I think it is uh, somewhat of a cultural uh, issue. Uh, but I think the mission focus could be translated into a service or a department or an area that's focused on the life counseling, that works hand in glove with the private sector on the outside. Organizations and associations like the International Franchise Association that can talk to people so that there's a full range of um, uh, of discussions and counseling and outcomes that are there for that veteran by punching one button. It goes back to the summit we talked about a while ago, uh, it seems to me. But yes, I, I, that's, that would be, I think that would go a long way to providing solutions uh, in repatriation and transition. Just one other quick question. Uh, do you uh, see it possible to truly have a, a and I hope you do, effective clearinghouse? You know, they engage large corporations, small businesses, where people can go and say, hey, I have this skill. Is there a job out there for me? And then the other way around. Yeah. Anyone can take that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Congressman, first of all, thank you for your continuing service. Um, I think there's some very encouraging work going on in the Department of Defense and in the services that suggest that, frankly, these discussions ought to occur at enlistment or commissioning. because all of us are going to transition, whether it's at an 
uh, at a career stage after many years or after one enlistment. And I think discussions about how the military fits in uh, to your larger life plan, as many have, have, have described, are, are happening. I don't think they're happening fast enough, and I don't think they're happening um, with the urgency to recognize the fact that, that the force is going to look far different in the not too distant future than it looks today. And I think we have to help those folks with the next stages of their lives. And I think the department um, is, is seeing the self, uh, the enlightened self-interest in all of that for a lot of economic reasons. Thank you. And I'm out of time, so I yield back. Thank you, General, for yielding. Ms. Kuster, recognized. Thank you very much. And I very much appreciate your testimony here today. Um, thank you all for your service as well. What I wanted to focus on is this issue about translating the skills, because that's what I keep running into over and over at home. And I was really <clears throat> encouraged last week in a meeting um, with some folks from Home Depot on their initiative on hiring veterans. They talked about they've developed a partnership with Monster.com that would translate the military skills that are transferable to the civilian workforce. So um, it, we know that that's difficult right now because of the different terminal, terminology, but they've created a military skills tra translator available. Um, it's homedepotmilitary.com, and you may be familiar with this. The online program allows applicants to enter their service, pay grade, and military job title, and the computer will translate that experience into civilian skills that will allow the applicant to add those skills to items to, to, to a refined search to view available jobs. It seems to me, and I'm very much in favor with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle of this public-private partnership. And, and I particularly liked your comment, Ms. Casey, they don't come back to a government agency, they come back to our communities. But it seems to me that this is critical because a lot of the unemployment and this long-term unemployment seems to be um, exacerbated by the way we do searches now with new employees. It's the computer that's looking at the resume and it's just looking for certain words. And no military person is going to put down teamwork. You know, they're going to put down their rank, and the teamwork is going to be obvious. But if the computer is looking for teamwork, we've got to help with that transition. I, just, I don't know if you have any comments, but is there anything that we can do just with this sort of almost technical problem that people have, and it's particularly exacerbating for older workers because they're not going to use the words, the types of words that the computer is going to be looking for. If I may, Congresswoman, I think there's a couple of things. Number one, I think that um, involving the private sector earlier in the transition assistance process where they are able to talk about the kinds of jobs that they have available, the skill sets that they're looking for and inform that process. Um, right now, many of the instructors in our transition assistance programs, and, and I should say many changes have been made and many advancements have been made in terms of the revitalization and revamping of the transition assistance program. But I think that having some input from the private sector so that they can advise what they're looking for would be very helpful. I think the other thing that we've seen at J.P. Morgan Chase is that um, it does take more than a computer program to do this, which is why we have that dedicated team so that we can look at the skill sets of our jobs and also look at um, the profile of the military talent that will match and then provide that. But it's really heightening the awareness. We talk about that 99%, 1% divide. It's educating our folks who are looking at military talent. We did something as simple as, as looking at the way we do our job descriptions. Um, the first bullet typically would say, you know, four years of banking experience preferred. Yeah. Well, many military are going to look at that and pass right through that. Right. So if we make that, put it at the bottom of the pile instead of the top, all of a sudden we're starting to see increased candidate applications for some of these positions. So I think it's really looking at all that we're doing um, across the spectrum in terms of sourcing military talent and making adjustments across the way. That's great. Thank you. 
the uh, the experience we had uh, in a similar process on our WeStillServe.com website in 2009, we went through the process. Volunteer team of veterans at Microsoft spent over 400 hours mapping the MOSs in the military to jobs at Microsoft. And I would say that the the outcome of the website was a tactical outcome, and the real strategic value was we created believers on both sides of that decoder. Exactly. We were able to go explain to military members that here's a vision that you can dream, and to our leaders and members of our recruiting organization, we were able to point out the translation for them. And of course, the tool has helped to make it easier for someone to find a job on our site, but the human connection, the cultural shift that occurred through that education, I think, was the main value. Great. Well, my time is up, and I just want to thank you. And you can tell it's a bipartisan support. We're here to support you in any way that we can as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jolie, for yielding. Ms. Brown, are you recognized? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have a couple of questions, so I'll try to be succinct. Um, the first uh, goes back to the Chair's opening remarks uh, um, about military spouse employment um, and trying to move the needle on that. I'm wondering if we have any data on that so we sort of know what the unemployment uh, rates are and the number of veterans who are unemployed. Do we have similar statistics uh, for military spouses? There was a congresswoman, there was a uh, 2012 Department of Defense study uh, that demonstrated that military spouse unemployment as of 2012 stood at 25 percent. That's the most recent data that I'm familiar with. So way higher than the yes, and, and underemployment rates, I believe, somewhere in the 40 percent. Very good. The, the next question I had was wondering um, if there are any statistics as we, and again, thank you all for what you're doing, um, and as we move forward and move the needle on employing our veterans, are we also collecting data around what the average salaries are, are veterans uh, transitioning to the private sector and are better off than they were vis-a-vis uh, -vis their salaries, and in the military, do we have any data on that? Nope. Sounds like something that we should be collecting data on. Um, the um, As far as the, I, I'm actually carrying a bill to extend the uh, work opportunity tax credit. I think probably the whole panel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you would all agree that it is beneficial. Um, can you comment on how critical it is? Um, uh, to gaining employment uh, for our, our veterans? Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for the question. Um, while I don't want to suggest that, that Walmart doesn't take the work opportunity tax credit when we realize it's available to us, we do not make hiring decisions based upon the availability of the tax credit. It's too important to get the right people um, and, and so we, we don't uh, base our decision making in that area on the work opportunity tax credit availability. Any other comments? Well, I think that's accurate. It doesn't mean it's not helpful and that it doesn't uh, provide a benefit uh, that is uh, attendant uh, to making the right hiring choice. I've, I've heard some people say uh, in businesses, uh, in my district as well, that there are certain obstacles in obtaining it. Um, any suggestions for streamlining, streamlining that? No. Well, last question that I have is uh, based on survey results from uh, veterans in franchising um, and a progress report, uh, one of the key findings indicates that 80% uh, of franchises surveyed are not aware of any special tax credits available to employers that hire veterans. Right. And um, I was just wondering, um, uh, Mr. Amos, if you might be able to comment on that. Well, I think that it's, first of all, it's the newness of the program, and it, 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 there's some, uh, there's a requirement. I mean, it, there's not even any uh, statistical support for it that I'm aware of yet. Uh, so I think that that requires some communication and education to the greater franchising world that IFA uh, it will do and is doing today. I think that will help that challenge, uh, actually. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you for yielding. Ms. Tynes, you recognized.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I ask a question, I'd just like for the record to point out that there are two companies in my district in Las Vegas that have uh, excellent programs for hiring veterans. They're very innovative. MGM Resorts has Boots to Business that's been very successful, and Caesars uh, Entertainment has Enlisting Heroes. So we're proud of the work that they're doing, which is similar to what you all are doing, and I thank you for that. I'd like to focus my question on something that you're doing, Mr. Kelly, and that you commented on in your written testimony. I've been working on trying to get more uh, students involved in the STEM fields, and especially minority students. I think that's the key to good jobs and being competitive in the global economy. And I know that y'all certainly do that. And you wrote that you would recommend that the government enhance the rules of the GI Bill to uh, incentivize STEM education. I would very much like to work with you on the specifics of that and see if we can't get that done legislatively, but would you take a minute to kind of summarize for us what some of the recommendations are that you would make to improve that? Congresswoman, one of the, one of the things that we did as we've evaluated what are the best odds to, to get into large technology companies, and all of us invest heavily in Microsoft specifically in hiring our college grads with computer science degrees. Um, I also know, uh, and my colleague Chuck Edward uh, here in the audience runs our college recruiting organization, is you know, we canvass hundreds of universities across the country. Um, our service members actually choose sometimes to go to the least cost option, not the option that would most likely get them to the highest employment opportunity. So our top computer science programs, there's a large gap between what the GI Bill will pay for and even the yellow ribbon may not close it. And so we've talked about uh, the yellow ribbon plus for STEM education to make sure that the service member isn't making a purely short-term economic decision, that they're really looking at the fact that these are, at upon graduation, six-figure salary jobs in any of the technology companies. And the competitiveness as a young person, uh, you know, they have five job offers at the time they graduate. And I want our veterans to participate in that very huge opportunity in the technology arena. Well, let's talk about some ways to kind of get that done. Anybody else have suggestions along those lines? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to bringing some of that back to this committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. You're recognized. Thank you. And, and I would also like to thank the panel for their service uh, through them to their companies for what they're doing to hire veterans and for the, the testimony today. And I want to thank the leadership of the committee and the staff for uh, giving us this opportunity to, to hear from you. I represent the community of El Paso, Texas. Uh, at Fort Bliss, we have 29,000 active duty. Uh, within, the, uh, within the community, we also have uh, over 80,000 veterans. Uh, and we also have 9% unemployment. And so what you're saying today is very helpful for me as their representative to think through uh, policy implications, uh, efforts that we need to undertake even um, in our, in our uh, capacity in our districts to connect more of these veterans with their jobs. And I think the points about what we can do while they're still active duty are, are spot on. I mean, I think that's where, where we take it. And uh, uh, Dr. Winstrup kind of compared it to preventative medicine, you know, taking the, the necessary steps ahead of time. Um, and, and I also understand, uh, Mr. Cohen, that uh, in your opening testimony, you refer referenced uh, hiring our heroes event that you're going to have on February 4th at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. So I just want to thank you uh, for the Chamber's efforts in, in that regard. And pose my first question to you. Uh, we had an event put on by the El Paso Workforce Board uh, uh, in, in the fall of last year uh, for uh, a hiring veterans uh, event at, at the County Coliseum. We had somewhere close to 1,400 veterans come to search for a job. And as far as we can tell, we had only four placements out of that. Now, I know that you can't speak to the specifics of that, but given the success of the Hiring Our, Our Heroes program, what are some best practices or some best outcomes that we should be looking towards? Uh, and, and perhaps apart from your efforts, when we at the local level uh, take these initiatives on, we can begin to follow those so we can get better results. Well, thank you, Congressman. And, uh, and I'd just like to point out that uh, your staff has been very helpful in getting the word out for the, uh, for the Fort Bliss Veterans Job Summit next week. So uh, it's been a, another great example of public-private partnerships working together. Uh, one, one of the things we've learned, and, and obviously I, I can't speak to the, uh, to the event that you're discussing, uh, that we learned early on is 
uh, the importance of devoting a lot of resources, which we are part of the Chamber of Commerce's foundation, which makes us a 501c3 nonprofit. It's challenging to devote a lot of resources to, uh, to metrics and tracking. So we've instituted a very comprehensive 180-day after of action uh, process with phone calls, surveys, survey monkeys, uh, you know, phone banking, et cetera. And I think it, it's challenging. I think that would be the first thing someone, someone would have to do is to really find out what those numbers are. It's, it, to me, it sounds unlikely that only four people of those 1,400 uh, receive jobs, but it's very difficult to know unless you really are able to, to dedicate the resources to a comprehensive tracking after the fact. And, and to the, the other members of the panel, I know that your businesses um, and, and I think the general made an excellent point, you know, are hiring uh, based on the best fit for that position and are seeking out veterans because it's the right thing to do and you're not doing it in response to a tax break or a benefit to the company. And I, and I, I think that's really important for us all to understand. Uh, but Mr. Amos, in, in response to a question posed earlier, you were asked, you know, what more could we do um, on the government side to encourage more hiring? And you, you mentioned um, tax incentives and, and regulatory uh, incentives. And I wonder if uh, you and, and the other members of the panel could um, speak to some specifics, perhaps a state that has successfully implemented something where your businesses operate and have found a very competitive environment that's made it easier to hire veterans, uh, or something that has yet to be proposed that could, again, uh, everyone wants to do this for the right reason, but could make it easier for people to do uh, the right thing. So, so maybe, Mr. Amos, to, to start with you, you specifically said regulatory burdens. Are there specific burdens that would be lifted that would make this easier? Uh, you know, I think the simple answer is any relief at the line level, particularly for small business, uh, on the tax or regulatory side is enormously beneficial. Every dollar that a small business man or woman puts back in their pocket can be used to, in, uh, to, to open new businesses, particularly as it relates to the franchise world, franchising world and small business, uh, and for hiring. Uh, the reality is my friend Fred Smith at uh, FedEx, uh, as an example, likes to say that big business is the, uh, the engine on the train and small business is the caboose. And, and uh, he and I, in conversations from time, I've said to him, look, you know, all business is just not created equal. The reality is every net job in America since the mid-80s has come from small business. That's where uh, the, the seeds are planted. So in answer to your question, uh, I could fairly easily, uh, at the macro level, I think, go through some uh, uh, strong suggestions, uh, uh, restructuring Sarbanes-Oxley, a lot of things that would offer relief at the line level, including uh, um, uh, issues that relate to uh, energy policies and a lot of other things that uh, do offer relief. Uh, that for affect hiring in general. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and I know my time's up, so very quickly for the other panels, anything specific to hiring for veterans that uh, we could incentivize through federal policy? I think from our perspective, and, and the theme has been talked about here earlier, which is how do we do a better job of allowing the private sector to partner with our military bases or the federal agencies sooner in the process. There are some joint ethics regulations issues and things like that that make it somewhat challenging depending upon um, the perspective. So I think that anything that can be done to allow for that partnership to happen sooner would be very helpful. And I, I have uh, one very specific recommendation if we look at the application of a veteran database that has all the information. We look at the great work that the um, nonprofits that are hosting job fairs could do. The experience of someone walking in that door, it's daunting. So many companies. And the simple application of a dance card that says, we've looked at your data. We know what companies are there. These are your six best people to talk to would just reduce anxiety, the, the psychology of walking in that room. And I've been to hundreds of job fairs. And every time someone walks up and says, hey, I, I noticed Microsoft wanted to talk to me. I don't know why. And I'm like, you have to believe that this is your future. Let me walk you through why I called you. Um, and so if we could build a system that just said, this is your dance card. This is who you talk to first. Mm -hmm. They're waiting for you. And on the other side, there's a small list of people that um, I think we close the gap in sort of what I call the serendipity of recruiting, which always feels great. I love it, too but it's not the most efficient way for us to get the most people to work. And you know, businesses, especially the small ones, 
can't afford the investment that a larger company can make. And so to go stand at a job fair and get one resume, it's just, but if you can say, I'm going to give you six, if you come talk to those six, you're going to hire three and you can go back to work, it's a win. Thank you. General, did you want to add anything to this? No, I think they uh, they captured it. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the, the earlier we can have a conversation with these young people about their aspirations and their personal brand and and where the gaps exist and how to fill them and, and that we care about them and we'd like them to offer their value to us, um, I think, as I've told the the, the my colleagues in the DOD and in the services, uh, back to an original point that I made, I think this conversation needs to start at enlistment and commissioning because it's about it's about the back side of the life cycle. Um, and I think a, a lot of benefit would accrue to DOD and the services if if we would take a more aggressive stance in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank the gentleman for yielding back and I'll now recognize Ms. Brown for any closing comments she may have. Thank you. Um, uh, let me just say that I for 22 years have one of the largest jobs there in Jacksonville in Orlando and some of the key things that I've learned first of all to have for success it, you have to do a lot of preparation prior to the job fair we have training working with young people working with veterans as far as doing their resume resumes and getting them ready for the interview and another thing a lot of the employers they want you to go online so we do some research on the companies and go online prior to the job fair. So it's a lot of work that you have to do prior to the workshop, but I make sure I don't invite nobody that don't have any jobs. So, and that's the key because a lot of companies want to come to be there, but if you don't have any jobs, we don't need you. So it's it's a lot of work that go it's a lot of work to go to the job fair before the job fair happened. And so I want to thank all of you all for what you all are doing. And if there's anything that we could do to uh, make things better or uh, to see us move forward, I certainly want to be involved in it. Thank you. Thank you, General for yielding. And in uh, completion, I think she, uh, uh, Ms. Brown put a very uh, human face on what we see out there in our districts, uh, where we see a homeless mother, as she described, a uh, homeless veteran. I think one of the saddest things I've heard since I have been in this Congress is any uh, veteran is homeless. And there, are, there is a very successful program out there, the HUD Bash Voucher Program which allows you to have a voucher to live, but you have to find the housing. And the problem we found is we have enough vouchers. The problem is we don't have enough housing stock to, to fill. And uh, she and I talked about some things that we may be able to do to help increase the housing stock. This also comes with a, a, a coordinator, a, a care coordinator that goes along with that to help you find these programs out there. So the VA is doing a lot of uh, things. I think uh, Dr. Winster may have brought it up. Um, we, we need to back this up a little bit to DOD and start this process as it's happening. And, and uh, But I think that's very important. Uh, another comment I think is, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether you've looked at a military paycheck, but when I was in the military, the capital I live in Tennessee was Nashville. I didn't know what, I didn't have any capital left at the end of my paycheck. Uh, there wasn't any money I could put back to do anything but take care of my family. So. Um, I think having access to capital, uh, military paychecks are still pretty thin, and these soldiers live, and sailors, airmen, and Marines live pretty close, and they don't have the money, so finding capital to get into the franchisee business, and Captain Amos, I, I've, I, was, I was sitting here listening to your comments. I think I've actually solved the problem of where the veterans are. We just call the NSA and ask them. They probably can tell us, so I don't think that should be a problem anymore. Um, I think uh, one of the other comments, I think, and Mr. O'Rourke, you brought it up, I think that the Chamber does a fantastic job. I want to brag on you all about the job you're doing and, and, and the job fairs, and as Ms. Brown obviously is experienced with these, uh, but there are jobs out there, and the problem, and there are many jobs out there that are empty because we don't have trained people to be in those jobs, and I think that's what Microsoft and others bring to the table. And uh, I, I think one of the, the best things I read in, in this testimony today, uh, General, was, uh, was where if you're, a, if you're a veteran, you've honorably served this country, we have a place for you in our, in our business. And it may not be, and I know many people uh, that work at Walmart, 
and they started maybe stocking shelves or whatever. And they're now in the management position. So you're, I, I, my hat's off to each and every one of you. I can't thank you enough for what you're doing. And I think what we need to do is spread this word around the country and get the message out and coordinate a little better. That's what I've heard, and that's the difficult part. But there's so many people want to help. We just heard uh, Ms. Titus talk about uh, two separate programs in um, in Las Vegas, and and I would be remiss not to mention a company in my district, Eastman Chemical Corporation, who is headed by a Navy pilot. He claims landing at night in a jet on an aircraft carrier was hard. I don't know how hard that – he seemed to be pretty good at it. And he he also ran a tremendous company, and he's just since retired. Jim Rogers, one of the, one of the finest men I've ever met in my life and had a real commitment to putting veterans because he knew the value they brought. And I think the other comment that was made was it's not tax credits. You, you can get all the tax credits and things you want. That's helpful, no question about that. But even better is a good, a very good employee. Having hired people myself for 30 years, that is the most valuable thing you have is a good employee, well-trained. And this, the saddest day of my life usually was when my nurse who'd worked with me for 10 years told me she was leaving to go somewhere else. I got depressed with that because finding great people in your business, that's what makes you successful. And I thank you all. I want to finish by just thanking each and every one of you um, for being here. And in closing, uh, we want to be sure that you have that know that we have five legislative days in which to revise and extend remarks, the members do, and include any extraneous material in the record on today's hearing topic. Uh, hearing no objection. So order. Thanks to everyone for being here, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. I'm going to check on this girl. I've gone back two or three times, and she's still, I mean, I referred to my office to the DA, and she still was on the she has And to I've been there two or three times. But I'm going to tell you, I mean, I'm going back to the same restaurant. I would go back. I would go to the DA and ask them in their HUD bash voucher program. Uh -huh. Why is she? Is it an issue with no housing stock? Is an issue? Well, you know, I can pick up the phone with Puffer. I mean, so that's not it.